Hello. Sorry, we might have had you on mute. My name is Brad Gerlach, and welcome to our webinar. I am the director for the Western Center for Metropolitan Extension and Research. The center was established by the Western Extension Directors Association with funding from the extension programs of the University of Alaska Fairbanks, University of California, Colorado State University, University of Idaho, Oregon State University, and Washington State University. It is hosted by Washington State University. Before we get started today, we just want to go over a few housekeeping. Um, the webinar will work best on your computer if you close other applications while you participate. On the menu grab bar, the screen button toggles full screen on and off. You may want to watch in full screen and then toggle back if you'd like to enter a question in the question pod. The orange arrow expands and contracts your control panel. In the interest of time, we will hold questions until the end of the presentation. You may ask questions at any time by typing them in the question pod, and they will be answered as time allows at the end. Our webinar today is being recorded for later viewing. Following the presentation, there will be a very brief electronic evaluation. Please take a moment to provide your feedback. The Western Extension Directors established the center to increase the internal capacity of the extension programs to address metropolitan issues and to elevate the stature and value of cooperative extension to external metropolitan audiences. The overarching goal of the center is to help extension better align its programs with the needs, issues, and interests of their metropolitan constituencies. The center's goals and priorities are accomplished through professional development and applied research activities. The center believes that to be successful in the future, extension professionals will need to have the following. Project development and management skills, multicultural, multilingual capabilities, the ability to work through intermediary organizations, the ability to relate cross-generationally, especially with 25 to 34-year-olds, and the ability to evaluate program impacts with the context of multi-stakeholder collaborations. As such, the center will provide professional development opportunities through workshops, staff exchange, and webinars. The center has a two-pronged research agenda. To conduct research on effective metropolitan organizational and staffing models and best practices in programming, delivery, and evaluation, and to explore emerging metropolitan issues where land-grant universities can contribute to decision-making and policy development. Through such objective research and recommendations, extension programs will be able to provide communities with a basis for informed decision-making. Before we begin today's presentation, we have a few questions we'd like to ask you. Muted. Unmuted. To help us better understand who's in the audience, please select the program areas for which you work in. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll, and we'll take a look at to see. Okay, thank you very much for that. Looks like we have a good distribution. Muted. Unmuted. What is your primary role within your organization? Muted. Unmuted. For that, we have another poll we'd like to have. Muted. Unmuted. Muted. Unmuted. What is your position within your university? 
muted. Unmuted. Rusty also asked us to ask a couple of questions so he has a sense of who is out there. First one is, please select the term that best describes your state's overall and systematic approach to extension. Is your state top-down, bottom-up, a hybrid of both, or something different? Muted. Unmuted. And our final poll will be, please rate how nimble your local or regional county extension office operates based on the following five criterion. Extremely nimble, very nimble, nimble, not nimble, or stuck in the mud. Muted. Unmuted. All right. Well, thank you very much for that information. Um, we are going to uh, we'll go ahead and get started. And we want to go with today's presentation is CSU in the city evolving from program based extension to project based in Denver, Colorado. Hot shots, dream teams, and setting a national model by reinventing extension in urban areas. Rusty Collins is the director of Denver County CSU Extension and has worked for Extension for six years. His office of 16 staff offer programming throughout Denver in nutrition education, 4-H youth development, horticulture, community development, and urban agriculture. In his role as County Extension Director, Rusty is a liaison between Denver County and Colorado State University Extension. Rusty's experience is in community development and his work includes facilitating meetings, convening community conversations about wicked problems, and working with groups to increase their capacity and multiply their impact. Rusty has facilitated events and meetings for groups as diverse as the Denver Sustainable Food Policy Council, the Colorado Bark Beetle Cooperative, My Denver Recreation, the Urban Waters Program, Denver Forestry and Natural Areas, the Colorado Food Systems Advisory Council, the local food think tank, and the South Platte Element Enhancement Board. Rusty serves as an ex officio member of the Denver Sustainable Food Policy Council, a member of the Colorado Food Guild, and a member of the steering committee for the Colorado Food Systems Advisory Council. Rusty earned his bachelor's and master's degree in family and consumer sciences at Colorado State University. He has over 25 years of experience having served as an executive director of both the Neighbor to Neighbor, a private nonprofit affordable housing organization, and the Bohemian Foundation, a $50 million private family foundation. Rusty also operated his own real estate brokerage business in Fort Collins and served as an area nonprofit consultant for five years before moving to Denver. Rusty was a Fort Collins Citizen of the Year in 2002. He was appointed to serve on the Governor's Council of Housing and Homeless. He earned the Fort Collins Pushing the Envelope Award in 2004. He is an honored key holder for neighbor Neighbor to Neighbor. His nonprofit organization won the Al Palmer Outstanding Colorado Nonprofit in 2004. He has raised over $25 million for Colorado charities. And Rusty recently was awarded the Visionary Leadership Award for Colorado Extension. Rusty, welcome to the webinar. Thank you. 
you very much, Brad. I am very happy to be here today. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the webinar. It's good to have you from all across the country. I saw the list of people who are um, who are signed up for the webinar, and I'm very excited to have you all as part of this group here. So I think we're just going to get my screen up here shortly. Brad, do you have my screen up for everybody? Rusty, we need you to select your um, your presentation. Oh, okay. There you go. There we go. Are we up? You're ready to go. Okay. Um, hey everybody. So anyway, uh, thanks to Brad. Uh, Brad and I have worked together for the last couple of years. He's the director of the Western Center for Metropolitan Extension and Research. I've come to learn quite a bit from Brad and some of his colleagues at Washington State. And uh, it's really changed the way that I do business here in Denver for Colorado State University Extension. So as you can see, the title of the presentation is kind of the evolution or evolving from program-based to project-based extension in Colorado. So uh, I'm going to uh, take you down a rabbit hole here. So if any of you saw the movie The Matrix, uh, this is your last chance. If you're not ready for this, I suggest you get off the webinar right now. And if you are ready for it, uh, go ahead and buckle your seatbelts because this is a new idea that's coming out of not just Denver, but some of the best practices from around the whole country. And I think it's a way that we're going to reshape extension in Colorado, Denver specifically, and hopefully it's a plan that will create a resiliency for us for years to come. So anyway, we are going to... Uh, we're going to take the red pill and we're going to go down and see how deep the, the rabbit hole goes. So first of all, I just need to give you some general overview extension ease about um, who we are and what we do. And so this is probably very repetitive for many of you. So um, just in general for context, this is how we fit at CSU. We've got a board of governors, we've got a president, and then underneath our president, our vice president, Lou Swanson. He's the Vice President of Engagement. Now, engagement includes many things. It's extension, it's the CSU Water Center, it's four or five other different projects. But he serves as our director as well. Then I have a boss, Joanne Powell, who runs the Front Range uh, area in Colorado. And then here you'll see, this is an example of in Denver, uh, I'm responsible to the community. You know, this, was, this slide was something I pulled from a Master Gardener presentation to show them how they insert into our program and then reach the community. So that's kind of how we fit in the university system. Um, we also need to fit at in the local system too, the, the local city system. So here's how we fit in Denver. Um, now Denver, we do not have county commissioners like many of you have. We have a mayor and city council. So the mayor pretty much sets the tone. Then the money kind of trickles to parks and recreation. Uh, we work under both parks and rec. And then I guess if I have a boss in Denver, it fits under natural areas. This guy, Bob Finch, comes to me and then kind of, then my job is to get it out to the community. So this probably looks similar to what it looks like in your area, though you may be adapted to either more urban or a less urban environment. Just for your information, this is how the money flows. It's probably similar in your office, but if you look at the top of the screen, you know, that's the Smith-Lever funding coming down from the USDA. It probably... By the time it goes through U, the CSU and CSU extension on campus, my share of that batch of funding is probably in around, you know, 700, 800,000. I think my total office budget is about a little over a million. So the majority of that's coming from this USDA funding. But you'll see over there in the bottom left, City of Denver also gives us some money, not much, only 150,000. And then the, the other green box is, this is where I'm focusing this presentation on today, is we're seeking resources to create a resiliency plan for us in case extension never shrinks. So that, that green box that says external grants, cost recovery, that is the magic behind part of how this whole system is going to work. Okay, I'm not going to go into detail on this, but our mayor has three priorities, kids, jobs, and a safety net. So we work very hard to design our uh, materials so it looks like we're doing what the mayor wants us to do, which is exactly what we're doing. So this is just a way that we present ourselves to the mayor. Um, but now I want to get into our topic. So let, 
Let's talk a little bit about urban extension. What is that? Well, this definition, it's not out of Webster's Dictionary or anything. This is, this is more just an example. I thought to myself, I think um, one of my colleagues up in Alaska asked me, what is urban extension? So I just sent an email, and, and this is what I sent. So it's, it's the delivery of, I'm sorry, can everybody, can everybody still hear me? It looked like I went mute for a second. Okay. So what I've got is urban extension. It's basically doing traditional extension programming, but adapting it to an urban environment. Here in Denver, our urban environment, we're pretty, you know, we're small. We've got 700,000 people, but only, you know, we're in about a, a land area of about 10 by 10 square miles. So everybody's kind of packed in. And we've got a very diverse community, high, low income, et cetera. But our problems in Denver are very different from the problems that some of my colleagues throughout the rest of the state have, whether they're in a rural area or a mountainous area up in the Rockies or somewhere else. So what we do here in Denver at my office has been adapted to the urban environment. Now, um, so we're in the urban environment. I want to give you some context. There's something I'm going to introduce here in a second about a continuum. And I've struggled with the continuum because I've been developing it over the last year and a half with Brad and some of our colleagues at the Western Center. At first, I started thinking about, are we moving from a, a rural to an urban model and extension? And in a way, in Denver, I am. However, when I would present this, this continuum, sometimes I would feel a little bit of pushback from my rural colleagues. And I thought, you know, if I... If I define this as rural versus urban, there could be some problems. Then I was trying to think, well, is it more of an agriculture, you know, large-scale type of environment to a city environment, metropolitan? And yes, but that didn't really get it well enough for me. Is it traditional extension evolving into a new emerging model? A little bit. So where I've ended is this fourth bullet. Is it, a, is it program to project based? And, and my, my argument for this is yes, and, and I'll demonstrate it here on the next slide. So this is a continuum. Now, over on the left side, you see pro program-based extension. That's what we all know, love, and trust about extension. It's very relevant in the, er in the rural areas, large-scale ag, lots of volunteers, you know, smaller offices, single agents that cover large geographic areas. The, the county agent is oftentimes more like Green Acres from the past where they're, they're kind of well known, they have coffee with the commissioners, they'll come sit and have dinner with you and talk about crops, a lot of club-based stuff, 4-H, traditional fairs. County budgets are pretty good because counties like them, although they've been reduced recently. Um, it, it's typically more of a top-down model where campus creates curriculum and shoots it out to the county offices and they kind of present it and adapt it locally. Um, and what I've also learned is in these communities, um, some of our rural folks are a little bit skeptical of these urbanizing trends that are coming in. And so that's when I was using language, um, rural versus urban. It just didn't really make sense. So anyway, everything on the left side of this, that's what everybody knows, likes, and trusts about extension. That's good. That's our brand. That's who we are. I've decided in Denver, we're going to keep all that stuff. It's, it's, it's not this large scale stuff, but we have a program mix. I want to preserve that. That's what the public likes and knows. At the same time, look over on the project based side. Now, this is different. This is, and the reason why I've taken it out of the urban community is because I believe that project based extension can work in the rural communities or anywhere else. Um, so, anyway, when you get into project based extension, we're looking at shorter term, higher impact work enterprise-oriented, um, we're doing applied research for stakeholders, the topics that are very important like resiliency, we convene conversations. It's important that it's decentralized, that you have some local control. I found it to be very relevant in the urban areas, issues focused, and there's a new workforce out there, a mobile workforce, shorter term staff. These are people that are willing to work for you on an on-call basis, and I call them here in Denver hotshots. So anyway, this is the model, this is the continuum, um, and in Denver, we do a little bit of both. So here we go. Here's us, extension in Denver, and you notice at the top it says CSU in the city. Um, I am toying with changing our name in Denver from, right now we're called 
Colorado State University Denver Extension, and nobody knows what that means. They don't know if Denver Extension is the extension to a phone number, or if we're CSU, or what is extension, and, and why are we in Denver. Um, what I've learned from some of my national uh, urban colleagues is if you leave with the university and just go see, and, and then the city, like CSU in the city. So I've been vetting this idea on campus and with some colleagues. We're going to see if it can stick, but feedback has been very popular. On the left side, that's all the stuff that we do in Denver. That it's the stuff people know, like, and trust. Again, I've shifted some of the names. You'll notice we've got a community resiliency and climate change program. Now, do I really have a huge resiliency and climate change program? Not really, but we can certainly answer questions, and the stakeholders want to see that we're addressing those questions. Um, you know, we renamed a couple things like. Uh, We've got this civic engagement leadership. Anyway, that's all the great program stuff. I want that stuff to last forever, and I want to I want to preserve it. So I need money to do that. So over here on the right side is this new project-based model. So in this model here in Denver, we're going to be looking at conducting applied research, basically answering questions for stakeholders. Um, we can do literature review, quick best practices, case studies. Every project we're going to look at is going to be short term, less than a year. Every project, will, I will assemble what's called a dream team, and these dream teams will be made up of people that are called hot shots, which I'll explain in a moment. And on this right side, uh, there are no programs, there are no volunteers, there's no animals, and there's nothing that needs sustain. I want to get away from the left side of kind of creating a project and then having to find a way to fund that thing for five years. This is short term. We get in, we get out, we provide a report, if they need help down the line, that's great. We'll come back, but we're not going to try to sustain programs. So there's no programs, no volunteers, no animals. And I know there are some in the uh, the urban circle that, that are probably happy to hear that. Okay, so what makes us successful in Denver? Well, I've got a lot of things going for me here. It has nothing to do with me. It has to do with Denver. It has to do with CSU specifically. First and foremost, CSU is bottom up. We have our director, Lou Swanson. Three or four years ago, Lou switched us from top down to bottom up, and he really empowered the local counties to take control and have autonomy. That single movement in Colorado Extension, that was the trigger from when I went from, I felt kind of stuck in the mud doing Extension, and then all of a sudden when we became bottom up, I, I had freedom and I could do a lot more. So that's one of the keys to our success. Um, I also have access to a local checking account. It's called a non-appropriated account. It's our money. The county could steal it if they wanted to or steal it. They could take it if they wanted to. But as long as my account balance doesn't get too high, it doesn't really raise any eyebrows, and you know, that balance is the sweet spot's probably somewhere in that 150 to 250,000 range. But I can deposit user free fees and contract money into this account. When I was with another extension office in Jefferson County, if I made any money, it had to go to the Jefferson County Treasurer, and in fact, I had to write a grant to get the money back that I had raised. That didn't make any sense, so this, this concept may not work in that county, but it works here in Denver. And then finally, number three, is we are very nimble. My office in Denver happens to be one of the more nimble no offices that I'm aware of, but it's your ability to make decisions locally, spend money, and change things and adapt on the fly that are going to separate you from the rest of the country. Everybody thinks extensions slow to react, we're late to the table, we're stuck in the mud. If you can convince people that, no, you're different, you're nimble, you can react quickly, you can put something together overnight for them, then you're going to be much more relevant for them. And that's what we do in Denver, and so this nimbleness has made us very successful. Now, you're probably dying to know what a hot shot is. So here's a hot shot. Hot shots are experts. Um, I don't care what they do, but they're an expert at it. They've got to have at least a bachelor or master's degree. They become part of a, now, uh, this was originally, I was doing hot shots just in Denver, but they would become part of a think tank team that surrounds the county director. Um, these are people that have a good reputation, you know, with no credibility issues. At this time, this was a couple months ago, you know, it was more of a staffing arrangement, and I was looking at, you know, actually giving these people a name tag and a vest, inviting them to staff meetings, etc. Um, the big thing is that they provide talent that I don't have on staff. I don't have ag production. I don't have food safety, but these people do. 
And then here's the key. <clears throat> they will work on an as-needed and requested basis only. So I don't have people showing up looking for their salary and benefits. These are people that are only going to work when I call them to work. Right now I've got it set up that they're being paid as non-student hourlies. Um, continuing with this, you know, they're expected to give me advice. Um, if they conduct programs on my behalf out of Denver, those programs are supposed to generate user fees that, that pay for themselves. So if I, if I pay a food safety expert $400 to conduct cottage food training, you know, we better make 400 bucks and pay for that person's time on the deal. So I'm willing to look at programs as long as they don't lose money, and I'm willing to hire one of these hot shots as long as they fit into our system. Um, I, I'm looking for new ideas from them. I may ask them to do research, and they kind of work on a year-to-year -year basis. You know, we just kind of see how it goes. So right now, um, that's kind of in my office. I'm looking at a bigger model where I will actually involve CSU faculty as hot shots as part of my applied research project design. And then some of you may be on this call. I have colleagues throughout the country, especially at some of the Western Center member organizations, where we're going to sign up adjunct or affiliate faculty to work on applied research projects but outside it, that are going on in Denver. So maybe there's a guy in Minnesota who knows everything they need to know about a certain topic that my folks at CSU don't know, well, there's no reason I can't contract with that gentleman in Minnesota and have him be part of my think tank to get this project done. So it's very, it's very nimble and it's moving. So um, those are the hot shots. So what's a dream team? Well, a dream team comes together when we get a bunch of hot shots and they take on an applied research team. So any dream team might look like this. It's probably going to be a primary investigator and a co-primary investigator. So I'll probably play the role as co-primary and then who's ever the smartest expert on that particular topic, wherever they come from, whether it's CSU or Washington State, they'll be the primary investigator. Um, there'll be some project management coordination, some research experts. Um, I've got a writer on board who will help us write a one-pager after the report's done. We've got to handle all the money and the admin. So that, that's kind of what a team looks like. Every single project will have a separate team, okay? Now, I'll be a, a consistent member on every team, as will Adam on my staff who does administration. But the teams will look different from project to project, and in fact, from year to year, they'll evolve. So this is how it works. So what are we going to do? How are we going to sell this thing? Well, number one, I'm going to go to the stakeholders and, and see Hey, what questions do you have? What can we solve? Here in Denver, there's all kinds of questions. How come nobody can eat the fish that are swimming in the South Flat Denver? How come all the Latino kids are uh, obese at, at almost twice the rate as their colleagues who are not Latino? You know, there's a million questions down there. They might be resiliency or climate related. They might be related to recreation. Who knows? I really don't care what the question is. But if it's a question that we could frame research and provide an answer to, we'll do it. And now I'm starting with five funders in Denver. There's a Denver Foundation, there's a Colorado Trust, there's a Colorado Health Foundation, and then there's some departments within Denver, like City of Denver Forestry, the City of Denver Sustainability Office. All of these groups have questions and need projects done. They just don't know we're out here to do them yet. So step number two, we go see what they want. They say, hey, we want to know why, you know, why are the fish dying in Denver? So number two, come back to the office, look at my list of hot shots, and maybe we've got, okay, I've got two or three folks up at CSU that can fit right in faculty, but maybe I need, maybe I need somebody out of Washington State, and maybe I need um, somebody from Wisconsin to do a literature review or a best practices scan whatever it is, and maybe, maybe the guy from Washington is going to have to fly to Denver twice over three months to conduct some study. I get all those costs together. People will be paid what they're worth. I mean, we're talking about a payment schedule with adjunct and affiliate faculty that everybody would get paid what they're worth, so there's a high incentive for faculty to be engaged and involved. We can pay for their summers, et cetera. Anyway, whatever the total project costs, I'll add it up, and then I'm going to add 15% for my office to keep. And that's for us to manage the thing, keep track of everything, write a pretty report, and do all that. And that 15% is what's going to go into that original green box, which is kind of our savings account. Step three, 
um, go back to the contractor say, okay, I've got a team. I've proposed, here's my team. There's five people on it. Here's their bios. This is what we look like. We can answer your question in five months and we'll deliver it November 1st in a, in a 10 page report with a one page executive summary. They say, hey, that's great. We'll do it. We'll give you 50,000. And I say, okay, give us one third up front. They give me one third. I pay the people on the dream team kind of a, a fee to get going. And then they'll get paid at two thirds through the project. And then at completion, they'll get their final third of payment. But that's basically how it would work. The money would come through my office and get paid out that way. OK, now continuing step four, we actually have to do the project. So we're going to do this thing. You know, We've got four months or whatever. We'll do it. Um, but each dream team and project, it's going to be a standard approach. We've got property ma or, uh, property management software. We're going to be accounting the books. Everything's going to look the same. We'll have a template for the one pager. It'll look the same. There'll be weekly conference calls with the dream team. And so that we can get into a system where we're cranking through these things. We're probably only going to do one, two, or three projects the first year, but eventually we might do five or ten projects a year. There's a group in eastern Washington that conducted, I think, somewhere between 11 and 15 projects last year, over a million dollars in value. I mean, that's the type of scale that this could have. And lastly, or not last, step five, once we deliver the, you know, the outcome that they want, I'm going to follow up at six months in a year and just say, hey, how's it going? And what I've found is this is a great point to say, by the way, do you have any other questions? And because you've already demonstrated to your, them to yourself to them and you're credible, they may hire you for more. So it's, it's all about the follow-up. And then that step six, that 15% that we're going to charge, that goes into that green box, and that is our resiliency plan. If, if extension ever shrinks, I want to save those programs, God bless them. They're so important, I want to save them forever, so I'm going to generate enough money that we can do that. All right, so that's kind of how the process would look. And I would, um, before I close, I want to show you a project that's already in the works. Um, this just came, this came to us. I'm going to explain the nimble nature of my office. Six weeks ago, this project didn't exist. A woman that runs a consulting agency received a grant from the Colorado Trust for $25,000 to do what it says on the frame, establish this statewide food policy network and host a couple action institutes. Well. She got a job with LiveWell Colorado, so her consulting company couldn't take the grant. She needed a place to basically park the money and manage the grant. I said, why don't we do it here in Denver and let's try out this model. So we scoped it with the Colorado um, Trust. They wrote the check to Denver, Denver Extension, so we put $25,000 in our account and we're managing this project. It's got an end date of the 31st of December, so we'll be in and out of here. We've also already raised another 4,000 for it, so there's 29,000 in there. Um, it's a pretty easy project. We just have to conduct a couple of uh, these institutes, and we're going to set up this great like platform. But when it's done, we'll have $7,500 $7, to put in our savings account. So what this does is it, it shows, okay, the Colorado Trust, they're a stakeholder. It shows them, hey, we could give, it, we could give Extension some money. They're going to turn this project around six months, deliver it on time, and deliver us what we want, and come in and come out of there. Now, on this project, I'm not using hot shots or dream teams. We're just doing it with my staff. But this is the perfect example of what we could do on a national basis or even a statewide basis, um, just doing this type of research and project. So that's kind of that. That's an example of a project that's already in the pipeline. I just started talking about this idea, and things started falling into us. So if, if you like it, things will start falling to you, too. So I, I've talked a lot. Basically, what I'm trying to do here in Denver is, is reinvent that, the way that Extension does business. About six years ago in Denver, we might as well have been located in the basement of the courthouse covered with cobwebs because nobody knew who we were. Um, we had lost $90,000 of funding. We were almost gone. Today, we've got, a re we've got a revised energy. People know who we are. This concept helps us to reinvent extension locally, but I think it's also a model that any of you might be able to replicate in your areas. Whether you're urban or rural, it doesn't matter. You can put together hot shots, dream teams, applied research. 
And it doesn't have to be on this scale. It doesn't have to be a $50,000 project. It could be a $2,500 project. Whatever you need in your area. But I'm seeing this as the most successful way to get branded in front of stakeholders in an urban area. So um, that's the presentation. That's, that's how we've evolved from program-based to project-based. But we're still keeping program-based. And uh, that's what Hot Shots, Dream Teams, and this new project concept looks like. So that's the conclusion of my presentation, and I'm certainly open for questions and answers, and I'll, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Brad now for control. All right, great. Thank you, Rusty. That was a, a um, good presentation. We are ready to have some Q&A time, and um, go ahead and enter those questions into your question pod, and we will have them um, try to have Rusty answer them. Some of the questions that have come in, you know, are asking about is this PowerPoint going to be available and archived? Yes, we will um, archive this presentation and make it available on the website, and we also will make um, Rusty's PowerPoint available. So the first question we have here, and I'm going to also send this over to Rusty so he can see it, is how do you price contracts? Does the 15% cover what you put in locally? Does it matter if it's public good or private good? Well, those are good questions. Well, being that I'm at the very beginning of this, I'm not exactly sure what, what I expect to price a contract. I am going to base it on how much I think it will take to perform. So if they say, we want, we want this X deliverable, and I'm coming back to the example I used, I, I kind of have to sketch out what the dream team would look like, get these people on a call and say, okay, can we, how long is it going to take us? Is it 150 hours and whatever? And then I'm going to base the cost of it on, on that total cost. So everybody's travel or whatever that would be necessary in paying those people, if that's 50000 or 100000 then that's the cost of the project for me, but then I... You're right. I will add 15% on top of that. So that's basically my O&E fund, if you will. Now I can justify that, that I'm managing the project, I'm, I'm, I'm accounting for all the money, we're doing the reports and doing some internal stuff. But that extra 15%, so let's say a project's 50000 and I want to charge the 15% on top, I would actually present the, the project cost as 57500 And then when I get that check from that funder, uh, 50,000 of that would have been spent and 7,500 would have been left over in the account. Now, um, the second half of the question, I'm not sure exactly what it's going to look like. I think it's going to depend on who's funding it and what they look like and how comfortable they are contracting with us. So there's a lot of questions that still need to be developed. Okay, Brad, is there another question? For some reason, I don't actually see the questions coming through. Yeah, sorry, and I was on mute. Um, <laughs> the next question we have is, these Dream Team projects are on top of work current staff are already doing to preserve program-based programs. So is this, are they adding on to their current work? No, okay, so you did. Team, the, so first of all, the people on my staff that have full-time jobs they're not really part of this except for my admin guy who's going to do some accounting and then I've got another person who's going to do a little bit of admin. But So they, they don't even count. So the dream team that gets assembled, let's say I've got a project and I've got two faculty from CSU and the, and the project's going to take place over the summer. Let's say I, want to, I, I offer to both of those faculty, I'll buy out three weeks of your time in the summer of 2017. Similarly, we may need expertise from uh, Patrick Proden at Oregon State. So I would contract with Patrick and say, Patrick, I'm going to need a week of your time at X, at X dollar value during this period of time and kind of get that all put together like that. Um, and the people that are on the dream team, the only way they can operate and conduct an applied research project is if they, if, if they can commit to doing it. I can't sign up a dream team and then have somebody tell me, hey, I got busy. So 
that when I'm setting up the scope, I will say to these people, okay, this project needs to run for this particular two or three months. I need a commitment from you of your time availability. For those people, if, if they have to work, you know, if they've got full-time jobs and they're working for me, additional to that, that's one thing. If they've got appointments at extension offices where I buy out portions of their time, maybe that's another way to do it. Um, I'm still trying to figure out the how-to of that, but I'm not looking at loading projects onto already cast staff. These are this is part of the new mobile workforce. Like the uh, the food safety person I hired here in Denver, she's a retired family and consumer agent that did cottage food training and food safety for years. So she only wanted to work five or ten hours a week. I'm like, I'd rather hire you at thirty five bucks an hour than pay a fifty thousand dollar a year family and consumer agent with benefits when I can barely fill that person's full time. So you know, I'm just bringing in talent through this new mobile workforce as it's necessary. So that's the end of that answer. Unmuted. Okay, thanks Rusty. The next question we had is, have you considered custom training for local nonprofits? They pick the topic and then you develop the dream team, the trainers around that. I haven't um, considered that specifically, although some of what we do here at my office in community development you know, as you all probably do, you know, we work, we help these groups with their capacity, strategic plans, visions, things like that. I think that stuff, um, if I'm going to work with a nonprofit and help them come up with a plan, to me that's still programming. I'm going to leave that <clears throat> over on the program side under community development. I think what I'd be looking more for is answering a question. You know, what what does that group want to know specifically and are they willing to pay some money to do that, to have that question answered in a short period of time? I, I, I hope that answers the question, but I'm going to kind of keep those two things very separate. Okay, um, we have two questions that are kind of similar, so I'm going to lump them together here, is around the university and the, the Office of Sponsored Programs or Grants. Do they get involved, or are you bypassing them in collecting and managing the money? Muted. Somebody had to ask that question, didn't they? So um, ideally, uh, ideally, what I would like to do down here in Denver is operate projects where I don't involve sponsored programs, and that's what I'm talking about. Wanting to utilize that non-appropriated account in a moral and ethical manner that won't get me in trouble. But see, when when I involve sponsored programs up on campus. I lose control of this thing. I send it up there. I lose somewhere between 25 and 38 percent off the top, and I'm no longer managing the project, and I can no longer be nimble. I can't. I can't sign contracts. I can't, can't operate things. Now, I'm not suggesting that we're going to do what I'm looking at doing outside of the university system. Quite the contrary. I've got all the key stakeholders, my bosses up the line, involved to help us roll this thing out correctly to make sure that we don't get in trouble. But if, if I had my wishes and my druthers, I would never use this through a sponsored programs uh, method if, if I have the choice. Unmuted. Okay, we have another couple of questions that are sort of similar here is, um, how do you inform stakeholders of this service? Have you developed marketing materials and sort of linked to that are, um, what effective methods have you found that helps you hear of potential projects that you can be involved in? So sort of both sides of a coin there. Well, you did. I'm very fortunate in that I have a good network here in Denver. So mostly the questions that are out there, I'm aware of them just because of the work that we're doing. You know, the, the work on the street. I'm, as you heard from my bio, I'm all over the food local food system, so I know what questions they want. I, that's how I knew about this $25,000 grant. So I'm not trying to, I'm, I'm actually not putting together a fancy brochure and polishing it and trying to go do a dog and pony show for people. I, I've got the concept, and up to this point, I've basically been sitting down and having coffee and saying, hey, listen, this is what we're thinking about. What do you think? And everybody jumps on board very excited. So. Eventually, yes, I'll have a brochure, you know, a glossy brochure that says, hey, we have an applied research arm. This is what we do. This is how we put together dream teams and hot shots. I don't have that yet. We'll develop that. But in the meantime, I'm going to be selling this idea 
just by going and visiting these people one on one. All those foundations I mentioned earlier, just because I've worked in Denver for five years, you know, I know those people on a first name basis. So it's not like, hi, I'm Rusty from Extension. Can I come in? It's like, hey, you know, can I meet you for coffee? I've got something really important I want to talk to you about. And so that's going to be the approach. Very soft, very, you know, soft glove, soft touch, um, mostly talking. I'm not looking to like go do fancy presentations with this. I want to, I want to sell it. I want to get a couple good projects, get a couple good wins, and get some stuff under our belt so that we look as good on, you know, in real life as we look on paper. Unmuted. Okay, uh, the next question we have here is, how will you measure long-term impact of your projects? Okay, so Muted. we start to come into the six month and one year follow-up. You know, we're gonna deliver a report. So we deliver a report after three months and it's got a 10 page, you know, a, a bigger report that goes with it. That's great, they answer their question. Six months later and one year later, I call back and I say, hey, how's it going? Did you have any other questions? Um, one of the key things that I don't know how to do very well in extension is measure long-term success. We're, we do it a little bit in 4-H, but we do so much short-term programming, we lose sight of these kids over time. And I don't know what happens to them down the road oftentimes. I don't want that to happen in this situation. There's, there's something going on in Denver and probably in your area too. It's, it's ripple effect mapping. It's the idea that, you know, an event takes place and then the, the it, it kind of ripples out. The effects of it ripple out into areas and arenas that you wouldn't anticipate. And sometimes you could have impact in a whole other area because of an event that you did that you didn't know about. So I'm very interested in seeing that. Like if we can answer a question, okay, here's why the fish are dying. You need to do this. And then five years later, we, we provide another report and say, hey, look, the fish aren't dying anymore because you followed this. I think that would be outstanding. I think it would be in line with what we try to represent at the university, which are some of these longitudinal science-based things. So, I mean, that would be great material for journals of extension and stuff. Right now, I'm beginning and I'm in the first year, so I, I'm not even thinking long term, but I think it's a great idea. Unmuted. Great. Our um, next question here is, do you vet the hot shots to guarantee their quality of work? If yes, how do you do that? Muted. The answer is yes, and up to this point, I have been vetting them with a committee of one myself. Um, but that won't last forever. You know, when I'm doing these hot shots on my staff, it's easy for me to hire a food safety person, and it's it's easy for me to put a, put a production guy in and have him do a workshop. It's going to be a little bit more complicated for me to sign up, you know, colleagues from around the, the, the nation who are already faculty, and I'm trying to get them to become an adjunct or affiliate faculty with here. The sign-up process is going to be a little bit more difficult, and I'm sure the question will come up, well, how have these people been vetted? Have you just signed up all your best friends to be hot shots, or are these really the leading experts in the country? I'll come back to the original idea. You know, a, a hotshot, they have to be an expert, they have to be recognized as an expert, and they have to have spotless credibility. And they have to, you know, and they have to have a certain level of degree behind them. As long as they've got that, you know, I'm comfortable working with those type of people right out of my office. When I go on the national model, you know, I might want some kind of a, a way to vet that a little bit differently so it doesn't look like I'm just picking and choosing my favorites. Um, I don't really know what that looks like, but I think it's something that will come up eventually. Unmuted. Okay, I'm going to kind of put a couple of questions here together, Rusty, and I, I think they're related, but you can take them separate if you want. Um, part of this is, are you charging fees for your ongoing traditional programs? And sort of related to that, um, are the, you still have your core programs and this new model is a sustainability plan? Is that how you're viewing it? Yeah, so you did. On the, on the, back to the old, the, the left side of that chart, the program side, yeah, you know, we charge some fees in there. I think on an annual basis, it's probably 30000 You know, we've got master gardener fees and we do a plant sale and, I don't know, whatever, you know, whatever you do, just little small stuff dribbles here and there. So we, those are called user fees, cost recovery. 
basically it kind of breaks even by the time we do the program. If I get user fees, cost recovery from programs, I also put that money in that same green box, that check, that savings account that we have. Okay, so yeah, program side does generate some fees. They're also supported by the money that CSU gives us and the city of Denver gives us. But this applied research, this project-based side, that's where the real dollars are going to come in. I'm not looking at dribbles. And, and, and I mean, if we're talking projects minimum size, 15,000 up to say 100, 150, and if in five years we're spending five of ten of these a year, you know, we're looking at about a million bucks running through this office. So I'm not worried about the dribbles on the program side. They can they can you know charge fees or make try to break even as possible. But it's this it's this new side that's going to subsidize the core. I'm never going to get rid of 4-H or I'm never going to get rid of horticulture, but I can't guarantee that that's going to be funded forever. So I'm going to fund it myself through this money from the project-based side so that it lasts forever, if that makes sense. Unmuted. Kay and Rusty, I realized I missed part of one of these questions here. So going back to if you're charging fees for your traditional programs, do you add a percentage on top of actual cost? And if not, why not? Muted. No, on, on the traditional stuff, like if somebody signs up for a cottage food training class and they pay 30 bucks, no, it's just a $30 fee. I, really, I don't try to make money off the public. That stuff, that stuff makes, you know, it breaks even, maybe loses money at best. That's why I don't want to nickel and dime the public. And, and like, I don't want to create new programs that need sustain, and I don't want to charge Jim and Joe public 10 extra dollars to do it. I want to charge groups that have money, municipalities, county commissioners, foundations who are legally bound to spend money and have questions. Those are, that's my new clientele. Those are the people that have money. And I want to, I want to make money off of them, but not at the expense of the consumer. I'd rather, I'd rather do everything we do for free and fund everything we do out of the project based side if I had my druthers. Unmuted. Um, so our next question here is, how do specialists, and I'm assuming this is meaning sort of state level specialists within your university, feel about you doing this? Are they feeling that you are stepping on toes with community partners or funders or other stakeholders? Muted. That has yet to be decided. But yeah, I'm, I'm tiptoeing in some sensitive waters here. Now I've got, I've already vetted this with five people on campus, five faculty members at CSU that I know I want as part of my CSU hotshots. They all have expressed interest. They love the idea. They like the idea of being able to make money over the summer or whatever. However, when I've talked about this idea in front of extension in general, boy, I've had some real bristling happen, especially from some of our longer term agents, you know, maybe like 20, 30 year people that hear about this concept and they think, is this a new way? Am I going to be replaced by this new mobile workforce that gets paid on call? Whatever happened to the good old fashioned salary and benefited job? So I'm not looking to get rid of the old way. There's still a lot of value. I mean, I still need a dozen people at my office to work and get paid and get benefits every day. This is just a new manner of accessing a different type of employee and a different type of a workforce in a different manner. So it's not, one's not at the exclusion of the other, but they're both, they both kind of work together side by side. Unmuted. Okay, and I think the last question we'll have time for is, do you have parameters for the type of research you will accept to do? Muted. Not yet, but uh, you know, if you have some feedback on that, I'd, I'd welcome it. What I'm expecting, see, the way that I look at myself in this, I'm just kind of like the wedding planner, okay? You people out in the extension offices and faculty, you're the smart ones. So all I'm going to do is plan the wedding. So let's say a first project rolls across the desk, I get five smart people on a dream team. Those are the people that are going to inform me about that question because I'm just not smart enough to know that stuff, but I'm smart enough to get the right people at the table that, that do know that stuff. So I think that conversation 
and approaching that will take place at that point. All I'm going to worry about initially is selling the idea and putting together a team, and then we'll go from there. Unmuted. All right. Well, I think that's going to wrap it up for today. I want to thank you for par participating in today's webinar. Um, this webinar is offered free of charge by the support from the contributing members to the Western Center. At the end of this webinar, a brief survey will launch. Please take some time to complete the survey as it will help us both improve future webinars and help us to report back to our funders on the value and impact of this webinar. The Center is planning to have monthly webinars on the last Thursday of every month from noon to 1 p.m. Pacific time. Please join us for our next webinar, Successful Urban Programming, Building from the Traditional Base, on Thursday, July 30th. Registration is open and available from the WCMER website. And for other WCMER opportunities, please check out our website and join our email list. Thank you for participating, and that will end our program. Muted.